Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achim. As you can see, I have with me Lieutenant General Syed Atta Hasnain. The topic for the day is Sri Lanka. Now, here is a person who's a strategic thinker and a writer, and someone who's been there. It'll be interesting perspective to find out what he thinks of the recent and the ongoing crisis in Sri Lanka. Sir, thank you so much for joining me, and uh, it'll be interesting, as I said, to know your views from someone who's actually. step foot on that country thank you adi thank you very much yes i was very much a part of the indian peacekeeping force or what is called the ipkf uh, which was there in sri lanka from 1987 august to uh, the month of march 1990 i spent a fair amount of time in the area around wabunia mulai tuvu where much of the battles with the ltt were fought by the ipkf and later by the sri lankan army too interesting sir uh that is i think is going to give you a additional perspective into the country sir but you know my basic question to begin this conversation is sri lanka is a beautiful country uh i know people who've gone there they really love it and i know for a fact that it took away a huge amount from the south indian tourism market in india when it came out into the game of tourism sir they've got a great location ports this that and everything but somewhere down the line they kind of slipped and my question i think and this is not just my question everybody is wanting to know why sir see adi there's no doubt your uh, commencement of your perception about sri lanka that it's a beautiful country the pearl shaped uh, island in the indian ocean midway between the suez canal or the gulf region and the straits of malacca all everything is there very good climatically pretty good uh it's a like area where you actually throw a few seeds and you'll find trees coming out almost instantly <laughs> so much going for it itself unfortunately it's the demographic makeup of sri lanka which has probably been its worst enemy uh it's got a sinhala uh majority but it's also got a number of other minorities along with them and who are geographically placed in the other sense the demography of of um, sri lanka is geographically sort of distributed uh you have a, a very strong buddhist uh, uh, element there with very strong buddhist ideology then you have a christian presence uh, and then you have the muslim presence in the eastern portions and you have the tamil posh the the tan tamil 2 million almost tamil population which is in the north and the north east in the area of um, jaffna trincomalee and places like that uh, now they have a great amount of affinity with the indian tamil population because essentially most of these people went as uh, the working class workers for the for the uh, to to sri lanka at some point in time in its history and uh, so you found a divided uh, a uh, demography between india and uh, sri lanka a tamil population in the north and the tamil population in the south the problem has been that somehow uh, they have not been able to get their act together of were living in unity and uh, much of the recent past uh, has uh, uh, has undergone a, a, a civil war conditions almost from 1980 83 onwards uh, till 2009 and they haven't been able to come out of it they haven't been really able to come out of the civil war conditions for example a strange thing a country of 20 million population has got an army which is 200000 strong which means it is just about 1/6 to the size of the indian army and uh, uh, if you take it that way then the population of sri lanka should be 120 million <laughs> so you know is in comparative terms uh, too much of militarization too much of security orientation consciousness interference by international players like china particularly which is deeply interested in um, in sri lanka because of its presence in the indian ocean the chinese don't have that kind of a hold anywhere in the indian ocean uh, region of course they've got it in pakistan um, uh, they they they've got gwadar in which they are working at the moment a lot but then the large expanse doesn't have a place which could be used as a naval base and i think that is what 
Sri Lanka virtually offered on the platter when it came to Hambantota, the very famous uh, port uh, town in the southern tip of Sri Lanka, which the Chinese uh, um, took it upon themselves to develop, and subsequently the Sri Lankans couldn't even pay for it, so uh, it had to be leased out, and it's gone on a 90-year lease to, to China at the moment. So keeping all these dynamics in mind, Sri Lanka somehow needed strong, good governance, mm. corruption-free. That, unfortunately, has not happened. And that is something which is being played out in the streets today. You see the demand and desire and aspirations of the people, which is so pathetic, actually, because these are people who have worked very hard, are capable of working very hard, but they find that their leadership keeps letting them down. The will is there, but I guess uh, will and the people are there. I guess the Absolutely. will and the politicians are missing, sir. So uh, you've been there during Operation Pavan, and that's uh, also a story that I'd like to ask you about. So that's first part of the question. Did you notice this kind of a culture over there at that time during these operations where the the will, political will to actually do good for the people? Was it missing? That's, that's, that's an interesting question, Adi. Uh, there's no doubt uh, Indian interests in Sri Lanka, uh, strategic interests, uh, are persistent, because of the f particularly because of the fact that we have a democratic divide. We were a part of the Tamil population on our side, and we were Tamil population on that side. Um, now we don't. We would not like to see uh, any kind of separatist tendencies uh, in our homeland. And uh, we would definitely like to suppress uh, any any such uh, uh, aspirations that the people in Sri Lanka, the Tamil population in Sri Lanka has. So we have been always assisting Sri Lanka to maintain its unity. Otherwise, for India, the easiest thing was to create divisiveness in uh, Sri Lanka, play one against the other. But the Indian intent has always been to maintain unity. Unfortunately, the Sri Lankan government, uh, the past government, uh, have done nothing really to uh, sort of placate the uh, feelings and sentiments, emotions of the minority population, the minority Tamil population, which has got certain aspirations of self-rule and things like that. Now, when civil war conditions broke out around about the early 80s, uh, the situation continued and we made our will very clearly known that we would come to the assistance of the Tamil population, Sri Lankan Tamil population if push came to shove. Well, in fact, we did a, a massive enactment, a massive operation in which we dropped 25 tons of food supplies to the Jaffna pop, to the Jaffna population in Jaffna by five AN-32 aircraft um, sometime in the month of April, May of 1987. And that sent home the message that time that uh, India meant business. And on 29th of July, 1987, we had the Jayawardene Rajiv Accord, according to which our, there, would be a, there would be a 13th amendment to the Tamil, to the Sri Lanka constitution, which would empower the, the uh, uh, North and East uh, uh, population of, of, uh, of uh, Northern and Eastern Sri Lanka, to a degree of self-rule, and uh, and uh, in exchange, the liberation tigers, who were the main separatist elements uh, fighting on behalf of the Tamils, they would uh, sort of go back uh, to uh, no longer remain in the bush. They would surrender their weapons, and uh, and that would be the end of the civil war. That is what the conditions were on 29th of July, 1987. But uh, as soon as the IPKF went in, the Indian Peacekeeping Force went in, we went with a peaceful intent. Uh, the LTT, of course, betrayed everyone. And, um, and they went to the bush. They, they fought us. And uh, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan army remained neutral almost uh, or right through. Three years this lasted. And uh, we withdrew virtually in frustration. Uh, that was the time when I had, the, had this experience of being there, uh, living amongst uh, the Tamil people particularly, and also... Uh, interacting with elements of the of the Sinhala uh, population, it was very very interesting to see the kind of animosity which existed between uh, 
uh, the Tamil population and the Sinhala population at that time. But uh, to cut the long story short, uh, in sheer frustration after 1990, the Sri Lankan army fought the LTT for 19 years more till 2009. And in 2009, finally decided to do a massive conventional invasion of Jaffna. And, and that is how they overcame the resistance of the LTT. Uh, they were accused of huge human rights violations, etc. But they won the war. They won that long civil war at last. The only thing in the end of it is that similar to Ukraine, where you find that after 1989-90, NATO did not know to what extent to go to push Russia, which is what has really led to the Ukraine war. The Sri Lankan government didn't know how far to go and push the LTT and the Tamil people. And as a result, since 2009 till now, the 13th Amendment has really seen nothing on the ground. And you find that the Tamil population is where it was in the 80s, virtually. Yeah. So this is a, a grounds for a lot of issues and problems. Uh, the fact that the Sri Lankan army is 200,000 strong is one of the reasons is this. They expect a, a kind of upsurge, a kind of turbulence from the Tamil population any time. And they would like to keep themselves at that kind of strength. Unfortunately, a nation that size cannot afford that kind of a securitization. And they have been trying to raise money from different sources, from the Chinese, etc. And as a result, uh, there has been tremendous corruption. There has been tremendous misgovernance, mm. which is what has led to the current situation where after the pandemic and after the Easter bombings in 2019, Mm. Uh, tourism has dried out completely. There is no development activity virtually and uh, and uh, there is no money. And that's the reason why there's no fuel, there's no food and there's no medicine. Now, if three basics are not there, where does the population go? And that's the reason why the turbulence on the streets is being seen today. I think a very interesting summary of Sri Lankan history, if I may say, recent history, if I may say so, sir. Uh, but my one question which rings to my mind when I hear this is that was uh, the Sri Lankans moving closer to China before we kind of look at other international interests within the country as well? Sort of a backlash of the Indian uh, interference, if I may use that word, within that particular time or the Operation Pavan at that particular time do you think the gap that got created between the Sri Lankans and India pushed them on towards China or the Chinese just basically plucked the ripe fruit? Very good question. The fact that uh, we went in in 1987 did not really succeed. We pulled out without failing. I would say it was not a failure. We pulled out. Thereafter, we had a, a run of tragedies, the assassination of Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, former Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, uh, the ne kind of negativity uh, in terms of our relationship with the Tamil population, the, the, the LTT in particular, and our overall wariness about what was happening in Sri Lanka. We were reluctant to sort of meddle any longer or even offer advice. And you found the willing partners with, China, with the Chinese. The Chinese found that this was a golden opportunity. India was on a virtual hands-off kind of policy, so they entered. I mean, the best, best exemplified by the fact that uh, the first offer for the port of Hambantota was actually made to India. And uh, India refused it. We, we just simply refused it. We said, we don't want to do anything with Hambantota, right? Well, many times today people say it's a good thing that you refuse because you see what's happened to Hambantota has become a white elephant. Uh, but uh, perhaps if we had gone to Hambantota, our presence would have made a difference. You know, we would have looked at it in a slightly different mode. The Chinese were primarily looking at it as a, as a waypoint in the Indian Ocean, somewhere mm. where their ships could halt, they could refuel, and it would be a strategic kind of a location from where future, the future domination of the Indian Ocean region 
could be affected by the Chinese. That's the way that they looked at it. We would have looked at it very differently. So uh, having said that, yes, there is no doubt that uh, our uh, reluctance to be engaged in, with Sri Lanka perhaps gave the opportunity and the space to China to try and exploit it. And they did. They did. And they did it primarily through the concept that they always follow. Invest in a particular family. They invested <laughs> in the Rajapaksas. And you saw the seven of them at the end of it. What a mess they made of Sri Lanka. When you say that, it also has other connotations. Uh, and we saw Sri Lanka also very close to Pakistan, for that matter, uh, in terms of military exchange and so on and so forth. You see, you see there was a level of desperation that uh, the Sri Lankan security authorities felt, perceived at that time. Why Pakistan? They also went to Israel. They went to Israel, and Israel came in and gave them a lot of assistance for training in terms of weapons, etc., and uh, then, of course, even Pakistan. And for Pakistan, it was a, a dream come true. Uh, no longer just looking at Kashmir or looking at the northeast through Bangladesh. Here was an opportunity to reach out into, this, into the southern states of India through Sri Lanka. I mean, it would be three-directional uh, from, the, from the west, from the east, and now from the south. But uh, fortunately, that capability could not be sustained. It could not be built upon. Uh, by, by Pakistan because uh, it, it did not just did not have that capacity and capability to to exploit. Let's talk about other interests. Uh, who else is uh, has been involved in Pakistan uh, in Sri Lanka? Uh, U.S. has a huge amount of interest. Is hands off mm -hmm. right now? China. I mean, it's exemplified. Out. It's exemplified by simply the fact that Trincomalee, the, one of the world's finest natural harbors has still today 110 uh, massive fuel tanks, underground fuel tanks, which were constructed by the British primarily for their operations in, the, in Southeast Asia towards Myanmar and things like that. These are all interconnected. Um, many of them have been repaired by Indian oil. Uh, 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 otherwise, uh, uh, there's all the potential that these can be repaired and the whole network of these of these uh, tanks can be used to um, store your um, strategic reserves of oil and petroleum for India if, if it is necessary. So this is a huge plus here. And this is something which was rumored in 1987. It was hugely rumored that the Americans were greatly interested in acquiring uh, Trincomalee Harbor, Trincomalee Port. And, and uh, from there they could, because uh, once again, like Chinese interests, you had the Americans had Diego Garcia on one side. They had Diego Garcia in the northwest Indian Ocean region. And then you had, they, it was all, everything was trans, uh, the Malacca Straits. So in between, if you get a, a port like Trincomalee, it would be something strategically of great advantage to the Americans. And it was rumored that one of the reasons why the IPKF actually went and why Mr. Rajiv Gandhi actually signed the uh, accord with Mr. Jayawardene uh, in a hurry was because of the potential American threat to come and try and take over Trincomalee. Of course, there's no truth to this. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing to prove uh, that there's any truth to this. But this was the rumored fact at that particular time. I'd like to actually keep a question on China, but there is something I want to ask you. So how do you read the current scenario? As a matter of fact, it's a complete strife. There are there are just two observations I have as a as a novice right now. So there is no leader in terms of a protest leader or a singular voice coming out of the protest. Um, normally you kind of within these things, you there's somebody who emerges out of these situations. We don't see that happening. It's, it's like a conglomeration of people that have come with a similar purpose. The second thing I'd like to ask you about this is that the political class currently is kind of hoping that the, the, the parliament would be uh, accepted and the constitution as it stands would kind of be accepted by the people they, they look at this thing. And the third part is, of course, the people itself. How do you see them uh, today? Because we don't see that internal clash between them. Uh, 
they kind of stand together with this thing and correct me if i'm wrong sir no no your your observations are very very interesting <laughs> all the all of them are uh, pointing towards uh, a uh, certain uh, aspects which need to be dwelt upon in a little more detail number one i think the bottom line of the whole problem at the moment is economic and social hmm. you see um, unless you repair the economy uh, unless you put food on the table and unless you put medicines on the table and you have fuel in the in the pumps to to put in your scooters cars and motorcycles there is no way that the population can really start living life normally that is what is the main aspiration of the people now coupled with it is this fact that there is a complete political failure uh, there is no leadership as you very correctly identified there is no leadership in the in the in in government in government there is no leadership except for vikram singh today really there is no one uh, in in government at the moment so it's a question of should you first create political stability create a government and then start looking at the uh, possibility of repairing the economy through negotiations with different people etc or is it the other way around now i think the more important thing at this time is to ensure a stable government first because if you have a stable government the one of the biggest problems the imf was facing just now with an imf was there for 10 12 days negotiating with sri lankan authorities they didn't know who to speak to and they went away in frustration so i think the 22nd of uh, uh, july is the date which parliament has set for the election of the next president uh, i hope some uh, semblance of some semblance of unity comes about some consensus comes about because at the end of the day they can keep fighting two years three years five years from now they can keep fighting politically but at this stage to fight each other politically uh, is committing harakiri virtually because you can i don't know how far deeper you can you go into a morass than what or sri lanka already is in at the moment mm-hmm. so i am very hopeful that there will be some kind of a consensus but uh, let me tell you it's wrong to presume that there is no divisiveness in in, uh, in sri lanka at this time ideologically uh, sri lankans are hugely divided this but this movement that you are seeing on the streets at the moment has got a distinct leftist orientation absolutely it's got a distinct leftist orientation so far we haven't seen much coming out of the buddhist clergy which is a right wing right and we have of course uh, the tamils are all quiet at the moment and in this situation the tamils will get discriminated against because if you are giving an amount of fuel or an amount of food to a certain uh, sinhala area i'm sure that same quantum of food in ratio will not go to the uh, north and the eastern area so the potential of divisiveness with the north and the east also exists so it's a very very tenuous kind of a situation but the last uh, uh, observation on this what you're seeing in the streets is a classic arab spring kind of a movement If you remember the Arab Spring, early part of the millennium, 2009, 2011, 2013, 14, in Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, and places like that, is typically that. Okay, um, it all get this inspiration. It's still very non-violent, and it all comes from the philosophies of a particular thinker uh, called uh, Gene Sharp, an American philosopher, who gives out this whole concept. of a non violent revolution in a, in his very famous book called from dictatorship to democracy right and uh, he brings out the ways of how protesters can actually remain non violent and that is what i am noticing in the streets at the moment so far it is all non violent one fatality in the last 3 months it, it is i i must i must uh, <laughs> really uh, raise, raise my uh, just thanks to them salute them for the fact that there has really been no violence maybe at the cost of time one last observation if there's anyone who needs to be complimented in this very very awkward kind of situation it is the sri lankan army the sla which has been very mature yeah. otherwise a an army they call it third world army is if a third world army is given an opportunity like this you will find the commander of the army immediately taking over and becoming the um the chief martial law administrator as it happens on our 
Flying yeah. in, uh, in, in Pakistan it keeps happening from time to time. But the Sri Lankan army hasn't been tempted by this at all. Very, very sensible. You have uh, great personalities in the Sri Lankan army who have guided the Sri Lankan army, such as Field Marshal Fonseca. And uh, uh, Field Marshal Fonseca, his political party is also contending uh, in, in the presidential election, which is taking place on the 22nd. We hope that leaders of the Fonseca kind can, can emerge from this because they are the kind of people who put all these other uh, unnecessary things to the side and only look at the national interest of Sri Lanka. Indeed, sir. The restraint shown by the army is appreciable and they've, they've kept the calm and they've now been doing patrolling and, you know, talking to the people to calm down. And that is quite appreciable. And it's a very professional army, uh, Adi. It's a very, very professional army. They, to, to, uh, you have one has to give them credit that uh, the way they fought the campaign in 2009 uh, was very professional and the manner in which they defeated the LTT. It's a different matter that they didn't handle the post-conflict situation very mm. well, mm. but the mm. conflict itself was marvelously handled. Sir, so let's get on to China now. And that is... Uh, to a lot of people is very weird because China is kind of the first one to come out and give a statement. They've got their... Uh, I, I kind of look at Chinese statements in a very simple way that they say stuff without any responsibility as per se or this thing. It's just a spurt out. And that's what they did when the Myanmar issue happened. They they, they called it a, a internal political struggle or something like that. Um, they, they never termed it as a coup. Um, the Chinese here have just kept quiet and the Sri Lankans have been asking them for help. Nothing came. The Sri Lankan-Chinese uh, relationship is a strong relationship based upon the Raja Paksa connection. Um, I, I think China has lost out very greatly with the with the eviction of the Raja Paksas uh, at this time. They, they, they in, perhaps erred in investing only in a single family to a very great extent. But there's no doubt about it that Sri Lanka owes uh, um, China a tremendous amount of money. Out of the $51 billion that they owe externally, the major chunk is owed to China. Um, out of that, $7 billion has to be paid, I think, this year itself. So that the Sri Lankans have uh, uh, appealed to the Chinese for an extended line of credit. Uh, for some assistance, bailout kind of assistance. I think they were demanding 1.4 to 1.5 billion dollars, which uh, the Chinese have been extremely quiet about. Now, on one hand, uh, someone who keeps observing this, I should be very happy to say, thank God the Chinese have got their hands off from here, right? But then you start thinking a little, looking at it a little deeper, and you say, why should the Chinese be doing this? Why should China not be taking an active interest in an area which uh, uh, obviously it has got a great strategic value for them? And then you realize perhaps they've got something else happening at the same time. Are they, is there some other influence, some other party, some other involvement in, uh, which is taking place? Are they investing in certain long-term um, ways into some other personalities and some other parties, etc.? I can't put my finger to it at the moment. Maybe still a little too early, but after the 22nd of July, we will know for, for sure. Uh, they have made a few noises. China has made a few noises uh, asking for peace and quiet in the streets and allowing uh, things to work themselves out, etc. But they've been absolutely quiet in terms of what assistance they, they can uh, bring to it. Uh, they should be realizing that uh, the situation is being stolen uh, virtually under their nose. If they're not doing anything, that's being stolen under their nose by India. And... Uh, I was on a couple of channels with the people, with the very, very uh, eminent Sri Lankan uh, personalities, thinkers, etc. And all of them were singing praises of India. All of them were thanking India for the support, the manner in which India has come forward with almost $4 billion of assistance, uh, credit, etc. Uh, and more is expected in the near future. Uh, they were all very, very grateful for it. So if that be so, why has China allowed this to happen? This is something which will probably emerge a little later. Let's talk about India, sir. You know, the 1987 backlash continued for a long time. And uh, I don't know if you remember, some, some years ago, the Sri Lankan ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to Sri Lanka was a gentleman of an Indian origin, by the way. 
His name was uh, Atul Keshab, who came and was, uh, you know, an interim ambassador in India as well for, I think, three or four months. During his time, the words that were used for him in the newspaper is Indian pigs go back. You know, it was one extreme of things. I'm just trying to say that. Uh, so India has to play this very carefully. Uh, and that is something I think that's a given. From the Please. careful part of it to the assistance that we've given, what are our stakes today, sir? And how do you see this going forward? See, for us, once again, I go back to it. Stability in the streets is very important. Political yeah. stability is mm -hmm. very, very important. Only then can anything else develop and add, add, on, add on to that. No, we are fully aware that there's, there is a minority issue uh, that uh, Sri Lanka, the political leadership of Sri Lanka, the people of Sri Lanka, if you go and visit Colombo, you will make it, it becomes very evident when you speak to people in the street, you speak to scooter drivers and things like that, you can make it very evident that the Tamil still feels very disaffected. Uh, he thinks that, uh, that the, the Sri Lankan government doesn't mean to do any good to the Tamil people. That's the feeling perception you get. I went there many years ago. Uh, uh, after my coming back from uh, the IPKF, maybe 20, 25 years later, I went back there again. I went around Colombo, and this is the perception I came out with, and I wrote about it also very, very much at that time. I questioned uh, uh, Field Marshal Fonseca at, in, in a particular gathering in public, and I asked him that if you had a second opportunity to... Uh, to handle the post-2009 uh, uh, situation, would you have followed a different strategy? And he was magnanimous, very, very magnanimous. He said, absolutely. He says, uh, uh, one, sh one, should have, one should have been more magnanimous and victory. One should have, it's not words to this, this effect, but he said something to the tune like this, that it was good to be magnanimous uh, with the people that you have defeated. Go back to them, engage with them. Uh, you know, the Indian Army follows the system of winning hearts and minds in Kashmir and Northeast and everywhere. I don't foresee, I don't perceive uh, any kind of a hearts and minds kind of a campaign in, in Sri Lanka, mm. uh, in the North and the East. Uh, otherwise, two, you know, you got two million population win, uh, there, which is a, a fairly uh, high number. That, that population can cause a lot of problems and disaffection within Sri Lanka. It's always good to reach out to those people, do something for them, put them on a little bit of a, of a uh, you know, uh, kind of a pedestal from time to time. And, 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 and uh, that's the way to handle um, a, a problematic minority population, if, the, if you perceive it to be problematic. You don't keep subjugating it all the time. Now, this is what is the problem that India perceives today, that the integration process has not taken place. And we would not like to see this situation, which is there existing at the moment, deteriorating into something else. Mm. Need, one needn't even mention as to what it could be. It could be a very, very dangerous situation. You saw what happened in April 2019 with the Easter bombings. Uh, we gave a we gave intelligence to the Sri Lankan government that this is a potential of this happening, and the linkages of that were being traced back to southern India, and uh, and uh, and the Sri Lankan government couldn't to get its act together, and they yeah. couldn't stop it, and so many hundreds of people who were killed unnecessarily at that time. So we don't want that kind of a situation because that plays against us, and that's the situation with all our adversaries, Pakistan, China, anyone will always want to take advantage of. Indeed, sir. That is the danger, I think. And we see a very soft-handed touch which is being played out by India. But the question while is how soft -handed, long? While soft-handed, Adi, I think it's very pragmatic at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I, I, I endorse the policy in which the way it is being played out at the moment. Um, in the sense, uh, there is... No commentary which is uh, being made, no official commentary being made on what the situation is. Everything mm -hmm. is speculation in the media, etc. The government of India has not said anything at all. right? And um, no sides, we're taking no sides, etc. We're looking at it very professionally, looking at it, the restoration of order and the restoration of the economy. I think those are two things which the government of India is primarily looking at. 
Indeed, sir. And they've just very clearly said we stand with the people of Sri Lanka. So that's very Absolutely. direct, Absolutely. direct contact. And India has always maintained that. I think with the Afghanistan situation as well, the line remains the same. Absolutely. That's a very good uh, example that you have quoted, a parallel example you have quoted. Uh, the manner in which the government of India handled Afghanistan. The investment of $2 billion, it was virtually a hearts and minds campaign that we, that we launched out there. It's a, it's a similar campaign which the Sri Lankan government should be doing in its own minority areas. Absolutely, sir. So my last question to you. Now, India can keep giving help. I mean, the IMF is something which is separate. We've given close to $4 billion. And I think that help will not stop. It will continue. Um, probably there'll be certain reservations as to how much. And so that's part one. And how long do you think this strife will go? Because the protest was to get Gotabaya Rajapaksa out. Now he's gone. What next, sir? And how do you see... Absolutely. That, that's, a, that's the million-dollar question uh, at the moment. Uh, how to get Sri Lanka back on the rails? How long will it take? A lot of people think that uh, 22nd of July, the government will come back and you have a government in place and other paksas are out and everything is good and back to square one. No, it's not going to happen like that. It's going to take a fair amount of time. When the IMF sets in, steps in, it puts down very hard God. terms and conditions. Right? It happened with Pakistan. Pakistan has been negotiating that $6 billion loan for the better part of the last three years. Right? And uh, still, they haven't. Uh, I think recently only we've been told that most of that thing is now being made available. Similarly, the Sri Lankans will have to go through that procedure, and they'll have to tighten their belt. Uh, they will have to prove a lot of things. They'll have to prove fairness. For all you know, one of the things that the IMF will demand is a cutback in the Sri Lankan army, bring it down from a strength of two hundred thousand to a lakh and twenty thousand. That's the kind of demand that the IMF will make, and they are they are, they are within the rights to make it. After all, that is, is the money of the consortium, which is of the bank, which is going, um, uh, which is being invested there to restore the economy. India definitely, uh, I think we've given our commitment without any hesitation. Um, they have not been dithering about it at all. And so we will continue with our investments, come what may. But there is a, perhaps a finite limit. I mean, India is, after all, not a, it's not a, a $10 trillion economy that it can you know, dig into its reserves and keep paying out like this. So whatever we pay, first of all, I think should be calibrated. It should be paid with to ensure that we draw full benefit in terms of our relationship. Mm. You can't have the Indian rupee being invested there and the end of the day, the Indian soldier uh, being pelted with stones. No, you can't have that kind of a situation. I think India is smarter than that. Uh, today. So we must extract full uh, the full benefit of it to ensure that our presence, uh, there's a permanent element to our presence there. Uh, our advice which should be taken as a, as a natural uh, thing with, with the Sri Lankans. And um, the relationship should uh, hopefully go northwards with that kind of a thing. Uh, but a tremendous amount of patience, uh, mm. lots of stamina, there will be ups and downs. There will be dynamics. There will be all kinds of awkward statements which will be made by people. I think uh, we in India will have to show a tremendous amount of maturity and resist uh, uh, undertaking any kind of knee-jerk reactions. I think that's a very good bottom line that you've mentioned, sir, that uh, in such situations, it's not going to be a singular voice that will come out of the country. It's going to be multiple voicing, you know, so many things. and. India's focus must be, as what we said in the previous thing, towards looking at people and, of course, our own benefit within the, this thing. And we Absolutely. wouldn't want to see Sri Lanka just, we bandage it and it falls in the hand of China after that. So that's something I guess is going to be... Absolutely. Another. That is something which has to be avoided completely. Avoided, sir. Sir, this has been a brilliant conversation. I think we've gone through a very, very... Uh, holistic picture of what Sri Lanka stands and why this has happened because uh, a lot of people just attribute it to the Chinese debt trap. Um, be that as, as it may, there are, as you mentioned, a lot many other things which are playing forth for this entire 
uh, catastrophe that has taken place in the southern part of, uh, in the, you know, in our southern neighbor, if I may. Thank you so much. Once again, sir, it's always a pleasure talking to you, um, and especially with your knowledge, being within Sri Lanka, giving an inside perspective. Thank next you time, so much. Thank you so much, Adi. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, sir. Till next time. Jai Hind, sir. Jai Hind.